Let's go in our Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And today we will engage in a look in, a, in the Scriptures at the office of the diaconate, those who serve as deacons, those who serve as deaconesses here in the body of Christ. Such a meaningful ministry. I'd like to give two analogies as we engage in this text today. Two analogies to help us understand this office. Uh, my brother-in-law, Dusty, is a fantastic waiter. Right? He doesn't have to take a little pad and he doesn't write stuff down. And he doesn't get things wrong. And he has this following of people in the steakhouse where he works at down in Lexington. They want Dusty. Like, he's the guy. And so as uh, people come, they just know he'll, he'll be nice. He'll talk to them appropriately. He won't, you know, you know what I'm talking about when the waitress likes, wants to sit down with you and become your friend and you're like, actually I was here with my family member, we have something serious to talk about, can you take our order? And then, He knows that balance, he's just good at what he does. He represents to those who come in and eat, he serves the, the customers, he serves them, and at the same time he's also serving the management, the ownership. It's, it's a dual thing. You can have the greatest chefs, you can have the best ownership, the best management. If your wait staff is lousy, people will not come there. If the wait staff does not understand what their role is, and they're just constantly consumed with whatever else it may be, it's going to be a bad experience for the customer. And you get enough bad experiences, then you don't go back. You go somewhere else. So there's a very important role that, that a waiter, that a waitress plays. There's, a, there's another aspect to this. When we go to eat, when Dusty is with us, he's been on the other side of the apron. So when he interacts with a waiter or the waitress, he remembers, I, I know what it's like to work with customers, to work with management, to work with other you know, employees. And so he's, he's therefore, he's very respectful. He knows when someone is doing their best. He understands that. He empathizes with them. And he doesn't turn into a critic of them unless they are horrible at their job and they won't change. And then he knows what you're doing is wrong, okay? If you bring a, a cup of water and you set it down and your finger is down in the cup, there you go, there's your water, that, that's not going to work, okay? He understands, no, no, how about you carry it away from the, where people's lips go, right? He understands that, and it makes him empathetic. There's another, another analogy I, I want to give to us, and that is collegiate sports, okay? A little bit different than professional sports, a little more precise than high school or middle school sports where generally people don't really go watch until it gets to playoffs and then they'll attract in. Collegiate sports, they represent the alma mater, they represent the school, they don't get paid to do it, or at least they're not supposed to. We won't get into that, okay? They're there because they want to be there. They want to wear the M, the S, the whatever the letter is, the U, the K, right? They want to be there. They want to be part of that school. And they sacrifice and they practice and they go through everything they go through so that they can be on the team to represent the school, to represent the alma mater, to represent the fellow students. And I was thinking as we were singing this morning and we're singing, these are the days, behold, he comes. What analogy comes to mind? Why do we do congregational singing? It's when the team wins and they go stand at the sideline by the student section and they begin singing the song of the school. Yeah, we represent you and you matter to us and we're representing. Not all of you can be on the field, but we're on the field and we need you and you need us and we're in this thing together. Now think about this. Sometimes those collegiate athletes, they go on and then they come back and then they begin to do camps. They begin to think of the younger kids who are struggling at shooting free throws or whatever it might be. And they can help them with some fundamentals so that they don't quit. They begin to give back. They begin to go back and reach behind them and pull young people bef before them. And they're, they're proud of their school. They go back to their college. They go back and they speak at events. Why? Because they want to say, I, I was here and I want you to continue on. And all of this is for a meal that you eat, and Jesus says, and after a while, it's eliminated. All of this is for, you know, trophies and titles, and after a while, no one remembers them. They're dusty in a shelf, and some maintenance staff has to keep shoveling, you know, shuffling the stuff around on the shelves because, yeah, you know, they won back in 42, and we're sitting here dusting the net again. 
wondering, you know, does anybody even care about the title of 42 and the five guys that were on the team? And, you know? When we come to the church, this is the body of Christ. This will live on. What we do will live on forever and ever and ever and ever. So I want those two analogies for something temporal to help set the stage for us of what we do in this place. It's eternal. It's eternal. Let's bring this closer to home. I've taught this sermon before. I've taught this section of Scripture. I've taught this passage multiple times. Usually, it's as we prepare to lay our hands on a deacon or a deaconess as they would be entrusted, they would be put into, installed into the office to serve. I praise God for those who have served well this body in the past. Those who have served in the office as deacons, as deaconesses. Those who have served well. Those who remain serving and in the time of instruction from pastors to throughout my 10 years, once you cease in serving in the office of a deacon or as a deaconess, you don't stop serving. You, you die as a deacon, as a deaconess. Though you don't come to the Tuesday night once a month meetings, you are still have been set apart by a body to be on the other side of the apron. You understand what it is to be serving people that are difficult. You know, sometimes it's like herding cats. So you understand that and you continue to pray and you continue to care for and you continue to reach back, pulling up those who are behind, not grading them like, you know, when I was in there, I did better than you. You know, when I used to wear the jersey, man, we won three titles and you haven't won any. You understand the difference? Those who serve well as a deacon, those who serve well as a deaconess, they continue and they go through the tape, which is the Lord's return or death. That is entailed in this passage of study today. And I praise God for those who have served. And some of them are right here. You serve this body. I want to I help you and, and encourage you in the understanding biblically of this to say, but we're not done. You now the day may come when I can't remember what book is after where. And somebody says, you know what, Pastor, we really love you, but you're going to have to stop speaking because you're just confusing everybody. And, and I, you may have to remind me of my name. You know, maybe Alzheimer's will set in or something will happen and I have to be set aside. But my heart will always be of shepherding, will be caring. It won't, you don't retire from that. You don't stop. When they, you know, I don't get paid to do that. And, and I wonder. I, I have friends that are not in ministry anymore. They don't care. And I see their posts on, on Facebook and I'm thinking, were they ever a shepherd? Were they ever a pastor? Or did they just get paid to do a job? I don't know. God knows. I don't know. But at what point do you just not, you know, you did care about People, when you, you know, worked for them and now you don't care. I don't get that. I don't understand that. So I'm just kind of airing out my confusion about those who are in pastoral ministry in that way. But the same could be said of those who serve in the, in the diaconate in my heart. And I've been sharing with them. My heart is broken over those who have been in the leadership, who have been under my tutelage and my training and my oversight as an overseer. And they say, yes, pastor. And then months or years or whenever later, they're like, yep, see ya. Like, well, who is that around the table as we prayed together and we, draw, we drew near together and we beseech the Lord for the good of the body of believers here and for those who are without Christ? Who was that? Where did they go? I, I don't know, but God knows, so I leave it with Him. I praise God for those who serve well as a deacon or as a deaconess here now. We have five men and we have four women who serve. Steve Aiken, his term expired in 2015. He agreed to continue on because we didn't have a man willing to say, let the man, he served six years. And we have, this is part of our let serve two terms and then rest. It's not mandatory, but it should be. Rest a year. That should be for the pastors and it should be for, to some degree for the pastors, a sabbatical. And it should be for those who serve. Why? Because we're so fleshly that we can easily say, I'm the only one. Nobody else can do it. I mean, I'm going to have to stay on in this college team for a decade because they're not bringing anybody up. There's nobody in high school now that can compare with me. No, that's foolish. We have to constantly be raising them. Dale McClarney and Russ Boy, they've been serving. Their term expires in, in January of 2016. They have served two terms, six years. Kevin Munyo serves. Jeremy Bouguet our deaconesses, Marlene Dixon, Laurel Emerson, Cindy Scott, and Kathy Caputo recently added. They serve the body. I have the list here. This is, this is the care list given that each member is entrusted 
to one of these individuals to care for them, to minister to them, to pray for them. And you know what? These are individuals who have simply said, all right, here I am. They're not professionals. They're not perfect. There's struggles that they go through as they struggle ministering to the body. So pray for them and pray for others that they would come because that's the third group is what about those who would come up? What about those who would say, I get it. God, use me to serve the body. I'll be faithful. I will plug in. You can use me. I will serve you and I will run through the tape. Would that be you? Say, well, no, not, not me. Then are you praying for others? Are you engaged in, Lord, we need others to come in and relieve those who have served? And as Dale or Russ or Steve come off the board for at least a year of rest, do you think they will not serve the body? Well, if they biblically hold the office, they'll continue serving. They just won't meet with us on Tuesday nights, but they'll still care about the people. Just like some of you still care and you still minister and you still serve. You're, you're, you're just as engaged, though you don't have a title. It's not, well, now I have to. It's because, no, this is who I am. This is who God has made me to be. This is what he's called me to do. So what about the qualifications for leaders? So last week we looked at the first section that Paul gives. The qualifications of the overseers, those who are the bishops, those who are the pastors, the elders, the overseers in the church. What does the Bible say? What are the parameters and promises for biblical church leadership? Now, Emma told me, she's like, Dad, I didn't get all the 15. I was writing down and I didn't get them all. You didn't. I was like, well, all right. You know, I, I didn't put them all out uh, on a screen behind me. Or, but they're all there. Number one, blameless. Number two, the husband of one wife. Number three, temperate. Number four, sober-minded. Number five, of good behavior. We're just tracking through the text here. Number six, hospitable. Number seven, able to teach. Number eight, not given to wine. Nine, not violent. Ten's a contrast. You've got to be gentle. Number 11, not quarrelsome. Number 12, not greedy for money or covetous. Number 13, one who rules his house well. 14, not a novice. That is, and they're not a brand new Christian. They're not a newly planted uh, individual in, in faith. Number 15, they have a good testimony among non-believers. Those are the 15 characteristics. 10 are positive, 5 are, nope, can't be that. You can't, you can't be that type of a person. That, those are the 15 uh, characteristics. This is what God, and only, it's only made possible, as I said last week, this is only possible to find someone that meets the 15 you know, character, characteristics here. How will that happen? It won't be because some man pulls himself up by the bootstraps and gets his life together. And now he's ready. It's because of the grace of God. It is that God has shown me mercy in the men who serve here and others who serve in pastoral ministry. Well, what about when it comes to the diaconate? It's the same thing. It's the mercy of God. It's his grace demonstrated. So Paul continues his divine instruction to Timothy. Timothy's in Ephesus. Here we are 2,000 years ago. He gives the guidelines for those who would serve as deacons, as deaconesses in the congregation. So let's examine this. What does the Spirit of God say through Paul to Timothy? 1 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse 8, and we'll go down through verse 13. Likewise. Okay, so it's connecting this, this line of teaching, the leadership, those who are serving in the congregation. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested. Then let them serve as deacons being found. And here's the same description, the same first characteristic that was given for the elders, for the bishops, for the pastors. Being found blameless. Verse 11, likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. 
Father, as we open your word today, we would ask that you make your book live to us. Let us hear the instruction here, Lord. And let us heed what you have said through Paul to your servant Timothy. Father, let us as your people be conformed to the image of Christ so that the testimony of Christ will be bold and brilliant here in this faith family and in our community and throughout the world, Lord. It's all only possible by your grace through Christ our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now in Acts chapter 6, and go there with me. Let, let's get the backdrop here. What, nowhere in Acts chapter 6 does it use the word dia, deacon. All right? no, no word here for deacon. But the, the ministry that unfolds by the seven men who are appointed addresses the daily needs of the congregation. And in the days of the early church, the church was growing. So whenever you add more people, it's just like if you're a rancher and you add, you know, a hundred more cattle, you would just add a, a, a need for feeding a hundred more cattle and then everything else that comes along with cattle after they eat, right? There, there's going to be the residual. There's going to be the effect of adding more animals to your herd, more people come into the body, more people come into fellowship, into membership. There's going to be more care. There's going to be more things to be taken care of. So in Acts chapter 6, here's an attack from the wicked one, from the adversary, from the devil, that seeks to undermine, seeks to un, undo the church from within. It's a more subtle attack than from outside, from the religious leaders that hate Jesus and, and we're not, don't preach in his name and stop, stop teaching in his name and, and we'll throw you in jail. And like, that's an easy enemy. Like you, you don't like Jesus and bam and smack and whip and beat and in chains. Oh, I get it. You don't like Jesus. Well, we love Jesus. He's our Lord. He's our master. And he said that we're to go into all the world and make disciples. So I, I, we're respectfully, you know, religious leaders, you do what's right before God, but we are committed to do what's right before God. And by the way, Jesus is God, and you'll stand before him one day in judgment. Okay? So that compelled them. But this is a much more subtle enemy, complaining. But it's a, nonetheless, it can be just as devastating, even more so. Because while your, your eyes are looking to the enemy, your eyes generally are not looking for the friendly fire. You're not looking for the people who are singing the same songs as you are to be the ones who are complaining and criticizing and cutting down and willing to take people out for their own agenda. Acts chapter 6, verse 1, now in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Now there is a hint of ministry. Okay? Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Now let's go back to 1 Timothy 3. So there was a need, there was complaining, and the apostles, the leaders said, you know what, we can't go into taking care of everybody. Pastor here, someone in the hospital, they're over there, run, go, go, go for every little thing. We can't do it. We have to get those in the congregation submitted to this and committed to this, and they will serve. So when we come to 1 Timothy chapter 3, now it's later, the church is, the gospel has been advancing, church is planted, uh, elders are appointed in every church. And we see the guidelines here given for the deacons. And it's given in this section 8 through 13 for the deacons and for the deaconesses. Now the qualifications for the office of a deacon are almost as stringent as for the elder. Why? Because of their pro public profile in the church and because of the servant nature of their work. 
requires strong qualities of maturity and piety. The only differing quality between the two lists is that elders must be able to teach. That's not a requirement of the diaconate, but throughout the church, when the church was raising up those who would become elders, often they would look to those who served in the diaconate. Why? Because keep John 13 in mind. When Jesus laid aside his robe, wrapped himself in the slave's garment, and washed the disciples' feet. If you will serve and wash the feet of other people and you grow in the Word of God, that is often the person that God can use because their faith has an effect. Their faith hits other people and not just their own family. It absolutely impacts the lives of their brothers and sisters in Christ whom they regard as family. Some of you, you're closer to family in this faith fellowship than you are to your own human blood family. Because those who are your kin, those who, some of you are parents, they don't know Christ. And so you, you, when you get together, you can talk about the lions and you can talk about the tigers and you can talk about whatever. But when it comes to the topic of Jesus, there's a disconnect. Whoop, see ya. And that's what matters to you most. That's, what you, that's the one you love the most. That's the one you say, here, use me. And they say, uh, he, he, he'd be, you know, killjoy for me. I love doing this and I love doing that. And I, no way am I giving him anything. So it's a disconnect. So you draw in with people who are like, I love Jesus. Jesus loved me. That's why I love him. I owe him my life. And other people around you that are sitting by you today are like, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I love Jesus and I worship him and I need him and I need you and we need each other. And oh, we love this church. I want to explain this term, diakonos. In the first century, there was a usage and an understanding. And I think perhaps a faulty understanding in our thinking today has led to the church being harmed at times by its leaders rather than strengthened and served. Philip H. Towner explains two features related to the, to the word diakonos. That's a Greek word, in the first century. He, he writes this. He explains it this way. First, one who served as a diaconess in non-church settings. Okay, so this isn't just a spiritual word. It's not just a church word. This word was used elsewhere. So if I use the word uh, a servant, that word can mean something in the church, but it can also mean something outside of the church. A waiter, a minister, it has one meaning here. So th there was a word used in culture that they brought in and used in the church. And so it's helpful for us to understand one who served as a diaconos in a non-church setting did so by commission or order of a superior. And as such, both represented and operated with the authority of the superior. There's a second explanation he gives. The sense of service as an assistant to a supervisor also becomes clear in the two cases in which the formal meaning of deacons is clearly meant, and he's speaking of in Scripture. In each case, the term occurs in relation to and following the term over, overseers. In 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13, where we're studying, where the most reflection on positions in the church occurs, the order of treatment and the greater attention given to the overseer suggests that the role of deacons should be regarded as a subordinate position and an assistantship in some sense. That's the scriptural layout of this office. So even though the deacons do not possess the authority of the elders of the pastors in the congregation, they still must meet certain qualifications. That's why Paul says, likewise. So it's a wrong understanding. Kind of my background was you have a pastor, one guy, and you have the deacon board, and if they sit at odds, man, they can just duke it out. And who pays the price? The name of Christ, the testimony of Christ. The church just suffers as people go in power struggle back and forth. Whereas when all are under the word of God, you have a multiplicity of elders, of pastors, of overseers, of leaders. The, the diaconate meets the requirements of scripture, the character here, and they serve the body. Then what is the result? The name of Christ is glorified among believers and non-believers. Because we're all under the word of God, living as slaves to Christ. It's hard to go wrong when everybody says, I'm a slave. 
What are the practical qualities of the deacon's character? Paul writes in verse 8, he says, Likewise, deacons must be reverent. Your Bible might say grave. Okay, it's the idea of gravity. Grave, reverent. They're serious in mind and character. They're not silly or flippant about important matters. They're worthy of respect. This is a man of Christian character. It's worth imitating. You can follow this guy. A deacon should take his responsibility seriously and use the office, not just fill it, not just have a name on a, on a church record roll somewhere. Yep, they were a member of the you know, diaconate from 41 to 44 or whatever. The men must be reverent. Now Paul gives three negatives. He says this man must not... Be double-tongued. Not double-tongued. What does that mean? Speech that is not hy hypocritical. But they're honest. They're open. They're consistent. A deacon can't be a person who tells one person one thing and they tell somebody else another thing. Double-speak. They won't tell you just what you want to hear. They will speak the truth in love. A deacon must be an individual that you can depend on what he says. His speech is clear, his speech is clean, and he's dependable. Not double-tongued. I remember a kid's story, you know, speaks with forked tongue. You know? No, you can't be double-tongued. You get the imagery of a double-tongue, it's a snake. It takes us all the way back to the garden. As God said. Right? It's that, it's that, trying to cast doubt on the Word of God through speech, through language. Not given to much wine, just as it is for the pastor, for the elder, for the bishop. This individual is not addicted to alcohol. Their mind is not captivated by alcohol. This is an individual that they realize if this causes other people to stumble and they're ministering to those in their care list and they, they pray over their care list and they begin to get to know their care list and they say, oh, this one here, there, there's, there's been abuse in alcohol in this family. So if I'm, you know, if I'm an alcoholic, if I'm a drinker, how, how am I going to help them? How am I going to pray for them? How am I going to show them the way out? I'm going to be no help if I'm saying, yeah, could you throw me a line too? Because we're both going down in this, in this quicksand together. No, they have to be someone who is not given to much wine. They're not greedy for money is the next qualification. The deacon must not use their office to embezzle, to steal, or to use money within the church in a selfish way, or even to make money for their own personal gain. You know, I got this business. And if I, if I could be a deacon, I'm going to get a list. That's going to be like a prospect list. There's like eight, nine, ten families on there. And, and that could work out really good because I'm, I'm selling this new product, you know, and how you can you know, sharpen your axe real fast or something. And if I got this list and those people, and they all know families. Well, good grief, that could be my retirement plan right there. No, that's wrong. It's not wrong to sell something or have a business, but you use in the body of Christ. And this is not, let me say it again, these qualifications are not just for the pastor. These are not just for a diaconate member. This is for the whole body of Christ, but it must be held by the pastor. It must be held by the diaconate. Okay? But we should all be able to say, all right, I'm walking this way, follow, follow, because I'm following Christ. And the people behind you can say, here's my compass. Yes, you are following Christ. Or, hold on a second. No, you're not. Compass says you're not following Christ. Wait, let's talk. What's going on? So I'm not following you that way when, when the Word of God says we should be caring for the lost and caring for others and serving and not gossiping and not lazy and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some. And you're over here. Okay, I'm not following you over there. You, you would lead me into disobedience. And you're a leader or have been a leader in the congregation and you're in disobedience. I'm not following you over there. Here's the compass. We need to be going this way. Suddenly the teacher becomes a learner. But it will be helpful if they listen. Not greedy for money. What about the spiritual life of the deacons? Paul says 
He says there's a positive holding the ministry of the faith with a pure conscience. Deacons must be doctrinally sound. Does this mean they have to know everything? No. Who here knows everything? No one here knows everything. Yeah. Unless you're young, you think you know everything, right? Nathan's like, I got it all down. What do you need to know? Who's missing on something? I got it. Just ask me. He shows his immaturity, doesn't he? But how many of us are 50, 60 years his senior and we're still kind of doing the same thing to the Lord? Hmm, looks quite different in that setting, in that context. The mystery of the faith. What is the mystery of the faith? Is it mysterious and you can't know anything? And you have to have a secret teacher to lead you into the inner truth. And Scientology, by the way, it'll cost you this much to get in and we'll go through sessions and you'll move your way up the ladder. Mystery. No, that's not what it is. It's what was once hidden has now been revealed and you understand it. In the Old Testament, the Word of God came through the prophets and they wrote, Peter says, and they, they predicted, they told what the Spirit of God and then they went to work saying, what does this mean? And when will this happen? And who is this? And now here we are on this side of the cross and we look back and we say, oh, I get it. Here's where David, we just read Psalm 110 today. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at your right hand. And now we, here we are on this side of the cross and we've heard the messages and we've heard Jesus ask his enemies, um, you, you love David. Who is he speaking of? Because he sure wasn't speaking of himself. Oh, good question. We're not going to answer you. So here we are, the mystery of the faith. We have now come to understand and it's the gospel. This mystery is not grasped by the natural man. 1 Corinthians 2.14, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Why not? For they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So they're born again, and they understand the gospel, and they understand the teaching of Scripture, and they've embraced it, and they're growing in it. doesn't mean they're a know-it-all. So if you're here and you're like, I, I, I would love to serve as a deacon, but I just don't know the entire Bible yet. Okay, well that, we're, we're all in the process of that. I've told you before, J. Vernon McGee, one, one of his last sermons is a shaky voice of an older man. And he says, you know, uh, I, I just still remember. He said, I've been studying the Word of God and I feel like I know less than when I began. And I'm like, woohoo! there's hope for this loser. There's hope for this guy because I forget stuff I learned. And if he can say that at the end of life, what is he saying? He's saying that the more you study this book, the deeper it goes. The, you thought you reached the bottom of the ocean floor. No, you're, you're maybe halfway down. Yeah, but our submarine is about to implode here. Yeah, so it is with the Word of God. At times, I mean, like, wow, how rich it is, how deep. The mystery of the faith is the New Testament revelation. The mystery of how the Messiah would be born of a virgin, the crucifixion, the cross, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the lives of true believers, the resurrection, Christ must suffer. Remember when Peter says, Jesus, Jesus, come here. I just said that you are the Christ. Now you're talking die. You're talking death. Knock it off. Messiah doesn't die, Jesus. And what did Jesus say to Peter? Get thee behind me. Yeah, devil. You're not mindful of the things of God. You're mindful of the things of men. Messiah will be cut off. Do you not know your Bible, Peter? Oh, he would learn it. And then he would preach it. The mystery. Seeing Christ crucified, buried, risen. Holy Spirit indwells them. Nothing is the same after that. Glorious truth here. What's another aspect of the mystery? How Jews and Gentiles would be joined together in the body of Christ. What? To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Right? The gospel, it's for everybody. It makes us one in Christ. If you're a Jew, if you're a Gentile, we all have the same access to God, and it's through Jesus of Nazareth, Messiah. Descendant of, we sang this morning, God of Jacob. He's a descendant of Jacob, not a descendant of Esau. Not a descendant of Ishmael. He's a descendant of Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's very specific in who and through what line Messiah would come. 
These truths are all revealed in the New Testament. And so this individual who serves as a deacon, they not only hold the mystery of the faith, but they also have a pure conscience. And this is all in holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. These things go together. What is our conscience? It's that instinctive sense of right and wrong that produces guilt and shame when violated, that God has written His law upon the heart of every human being, Romans 12, 21. So in other words, deacons must not pr profess one thing while, pr while practicing another. Because you can have a deacon that's I'm doctrinally sound. I, I absolutely believe in the sovereignty of God, the election, predestination. I can tell you every verse in the Scripture, and I can tell you in the Greek, and I can tell you in the Hebrew. I can love it all out. And then they live a, a hypocrite. Oh, what's going on there? All your theology may be spot on, but if practically you're living and you're not loving, you're not kind, you don't serve others, then you're 1 you're Corinthians 13. You're like, just get up there and start banging away on the symbol. It's not soothing. It's not pleasing. You know? Any family member that you ever love, give, give one of your kids a drum set, and then they leave. Merry Christmas. Our friends did that to us when we moved out here, lived in the parsonage. I think it was Sophie for Christmas. One of the little rascals in that family, Jared, bought, bought Sophie a drum set. It, it was like a... Like a $15 drum set. Imagine how lovely $15 drum sets sound. And there's Sophie. I'm like, thanks, Jared. You sure you don't want to keep that at your house and we'll send her to your house to you know, invest some practice time in that thing? Right? It's just a clanging, banging, clanging, and it doesn't sound good at all. That's what we are if we have all the doctrinal orthodoxy and we're right on and we're not loving. We care about ourselves, but we, we really don't care about other people. What good is that? Faith, hope, and love. What is the greatest? Love. And that's not disconnected from faith and hope. That's the demonstration of genuine faith and a genuine hope in Christ that we've been transformed and you're going to feel it. Your brothers and sisters in Christ are going to feel it. It's simply not enough for a deacon to believe the truth. They must put, they must put their lives in accordance. They must live this way in accordance with the truth. What about a deacon's life of serving? Paul continues on. He said they must be tested first. Uh, that's a nice characteristic. They must be te tested first. Now Paul's intent here was not to require some formal testing procedure, but rather that these men prove their quality over time in the or ordinary activities of life and ministry. After they have shown themselves irreproachable, then let them serve as deacons. So an illustration of this testing can be seen in the life of Joseph. He was tested over time, and he knew the Lord was with him, and he was faithful. So we don't have a special gauntlet, you know. We're coming up to January. We're looking for those who would serve as men, as deacons. And so meet us on Sunday, you know, Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock, and the battlefield is set up out back, and we'll see if you survive. You know, that, that's not how it's set up. What do we do? We look at who, who are those who are already serving in the body. Yeah, but pastor, they're already busy. Yeah, but those are serving. They understand, they care for the body, and they do it not because they have a title, but because they have Christ. And they're willingly submitted to Christ and His body. Those are the ones. So if you don't take someone who's not serving, you know, maybe if we made them a deacon and we appointed them and ordained them, then maybe they would start coming on Sundays and Wednesday nights. Wouldn't that be great? No. Because they're already demonstrating. They have a, a love for the church, but they love their schedule and their time and all of the things of their life more. That's not a person that you can implement. It doesn't mean that you don't have things come up from time to time, but that you remember not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. We're, we're together. We're in fellowship. When the body meets, the body meets. All of the body. So they're tested. Dokumazo means to approve after testing. The untested person is an unprepared Christian. Warren Wearsby, he says, an untested Christian is an unprepared Christian. The untested person, if given the office of a deacon, would do more harm than good because they misunderstand the function and the purpose of their place within the office and the body of Christ. Paul continues on. He said this individual must be blameless. 
Same qualification for pastors. A deacon must live a morally upright life. They are men who live like the, past, the pastor, the bishop, the elder. They're above reproach. John MacArthur, he writes this, he explains it this way. He says, deacons must not have any blot on their lives, nothing for which they could be accused, arraigned, and disqualified. How is this possible? It's only by the grace of God. It's only through the transforming power of the gospel. It's not through the genuine quality. This, this guy is really great, and he's a really good businessman, so he should be in the church, and he should be leading in the church because he really built a big business. That all falls down at the church. Character. Character. Godliness. Holiness. The pattern of life is much more important than your financial resume. The husband of one wife, we looked at that last week, so it's the same for the deacon. They must be known by all that they are a one-woman man. They love their one wife. They can't be multiple, you know, married to multiple women. They have to be a one-woman man. Totally committed and devoted to his own wife. And he says then next, he says, ruling their children in their own house, their house as well. So the deacon must have a Christ-like life at home. Like the pastor, the deacon is to have authority in his home. The word ruling means to lead, it means to manage, it means to rule over. He's a manager. The deacon is required to have authority over everything that has to do with his home and family. The leadership of the deacon should be a long pattern of godliness, leading his entire family, rearing them in truth and in the faith. Deacons are to be excellent managers of their family. And we get the right idea, stewards of their family, managers of their family. What is that? That's taking care of something that belongs in ownership to someone else. And that's what we are. I don't own my children. My girls are not mine. I don't own them. They are the Lord's. I'm a steward of them. You aren't mine, my people. I'm a steward. I'm entrusted. You're entrusted to me. I don't own you. And I will not be your judge. I will stand before the judge who is living. Right? He will test the messenger and those who receive the message. Is it true? See, that's what you have to wrestle with. Is what he is saying to me true? Yes? No. Okay, if you say no, why, why do you say no? How do you back that up? If what I am saying is true, that means, what will you do with it? Oh, I've learned a new nugget of information about the deacons, and now the next time my deacon knocks on my door, I can really get them. You misunderstand the whole message. Right? You need the song, it's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me. So as we think about this. Now what about their wives? Now the question, and, and this, is a, this is an ongoing question. This is a dilemma here. Their wives. Who is Paul referring to here? We've gone through this before. There's, there's three options here, okay? He could be referring to the wives of the deacons, okay? So we have, I listed off the men who are deacons. Is it their, their wife? Is it the wives of those men? That's, that's one option. Is he referring to the wives of the deacons and then linking back to the wives also of the pastors, of the elders, of the bishops? Is he including those two groups of in, individuals? Or a third option, is he referring to a separate group of servants in the body? The deaconesses. They're a separate group of individuals, Let's talk about this, okay? The deaconess. What are the biblical requirements in verse 11 for the women? Likewise, their wives. Gynecos, all right? And you get the word gynecology. It's women, their wives. So Paul lends this verse, I believe, probably for a th third group of servants in the church. Like Phoebe in Romans 16, 1 and 2, that title is used uh, for her as a servant, diacon diaconos. But we must be careful to be as biblical as possible in how we practically work out our church ministry and leadership and polity. I don't believe Paul is employing the second option that I said. I don't think he's talking to the wives of the bishops and the wives of the deacons. Why not? Why doesn't Paul, and this is part of the understanding, so Paul doesn't say anything to the wives up here in the top in the first seven verses. He doesn't say anything about their wives. He doesn't say anything about Ginger. He doesn't say anything about Susie. He doesn't say anything about, you know, Jamie Girl. Why not? Because they are not assistant elders. My wife is not the assistant pastor in the congregation. Now, I've known some men, their wives write their sermons. That doesn't happen in my house. Okay? My wife, her number one ministry is right here. And my three daughters. 
There's been a lot of pain in ministry when churches view the pastor's wife as a free accompaniment, you know, of the pastor. He, like, buy one, get one free. No. Her number one ministry, Jamie Girl's number one ministry, which is why when Marshall was born, she did not have to be at every last thing the church scheduled. Susie, ministering to the family when Caleb has needs, Noah has needs, all they've been through. Her number one ministry is to her husband and to her family. You say, well, that sounds easy. Really? Are you, do you live with me? Do you know what I go through? Are you praying for her in that way? I won't speak of it for the other guys. Okay, that's, that's why she's not there. If I drop over dead right now, she's not going to be looked at as, hey, let's just have, you know, she knows him really well. Let's just go on with her. No. No, that would not be an option. Our wives, the number one ministry. Is to, so why then would Paul write, and their wives? I think, it, I think it comes down to two things. For those men who serve as deacons, your wife, you're here. You're in this. It's important for our men, if they're going to serve the body effectively, but mama's at home, he's at that meeting again. He's over there visiting those people again, and he knows I need to be here. Um, why don't you go with him? If you, you're really missing your husband, then why don't you go with him? Don't you think that would be lovely as he's ministering? And how do we break this up? All the men who are deacons, they're given... The membership, they divided up the men who have families and single men in the church. Our ladies, the deaconesses, they receive the ladies who are single or, or widows. So if our deacons are serving and their wives are with them, that, that, what kind of woman should she be? It's here. And it's also, it's all the women of the church. Okay? So when you see this, when you hear this list, this isn't just for the wives of the deacons. It's not just for the deaconesses. It's for all of our wives. So in that sense, then Jamie Girl and Susie and Ginger, are, they are also like this. This is the character for all the women in the church. But if you're going to serve as a deaconess or be the wife of a deacon, this is you. This is a must. This is a non-negotiable. I believe that's the application of this. Reverent, that is, they're worthy of respect. Women who serve the church must be dignified. Same word used here that Paul used to describe the male deacons in verse 8. Their spiritual devotion to the Lord and His church should be obvious to all. This devotion will be sustained if they hold a recognized office, and this devotion, if authentic, will be sustained for life. They will live and die as a servant of the Lord to His body, and the church will be blessed by that. They're not slanderers. Same word for devil, diabolos. It's the word for devil. It means a slander, accuser. The women that serve in this office, if their husband is a deacon, they can't be a gossip. Yeah, that pastor, man, that's... It's deadly. It's one of the abominations that God hates. The one who sows discord among the brethren. These women must be temperate. These women who serve must be well-balanced, alert, watchful. That's what the word temperate means, clear-headed. They're not drunkards. They're sober in judgment. And lastly, faithful in all things. They're trustworthy in character. Women who are not trust trustworthy in every dimension of responsibility could not be trusted with this esteemed position of service in the church. Faithful. So think about that, ladies. Does that describe you? Are you reverent? You're not a slanderer. You're not a gossip. You are temperate and you are faithful in all things. Does that, is that how the Lord views you? Is that how he sees you? If you say, no, I, no I'm, I'm really, I, ooh. Okay, then what should you do? Lord, forgive me. Thank you for pointing this out to me. Before it's too late and I simply stand before you. And I can't, I don't have time to deal with it. I don't have time to go tell anyone I'm, I'm sorry. I don't have time to encourage others in this. Lord, thank you for pointing this out. Now, what's the biblical promise for service, for faithful service in verse 13? Because right about now, if you're thinking, wow, that's really tough. I, who would want to do that? Exactly right. You got the point. No one would want to put themselves in this fishbowl. If God doesn't say, hey, you, man, woman, I want to use you. You're going in the fishbowl. You're going to serve the body and everyone's going to be looking at you and that's going to make me more like Jesus. And you're going to have to depend more on the Holy Spirit and you're going to have to get into the word of God even more than you have because I want to use you. Okay, now you have a group of people that say, I want to be on the team. I want to wear the jersey. What does it take for me to do it? 
Because this isn't a temporal reward. This is an eternal reward for those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. It's Christ-centered. So for pastors, the rewards will be according to one's labor. 1 Corinthians 3.8, Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. 1 Timothy 5, 24 and 25, the pastor's rewards will be according to God's measurement, not man's. Some men's sins are clearly evident, Paul writes, preceding them to judgment. But those of some men follow later. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, and those that are outside otherwise cannot be hidden. Those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. So are there pastors getting away with it? Sure. But not ultimately. God sees all. Are there some pastors who are serving and we don't know their name and they're being faithful? Yeah. But guess what? God knows. So Timothy, do your ministry. Fulfill your ministry. Yeah, but it's not fair. They got Really? Who are you indicting with that comment? Lord, you don't know what you're doing. That sounds blasphemous. What about the diaconate? A good standing. That is before fellow Christians who understand and appreciate the beauty of humble, selfless, Christ-like service, that God will spiritually promote this person of willing service and give them more influence and opportunity to serve and minister. As you serve faithfully with little, then God takes and brings much. So this is an encouragement to those of you who serve. For those of you who have those who serve you, pray for them. God, take their little that they offer and bring much from that. And great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. This servant who serves the church faithfully before God and the power of the Holy Spirit is granted spiritual boldness that provides the foundation and fuel for effective ministry. We're looking to the day when Jesus returns and we serve in light of that reality. 1 John 2, 28. And now little children abide in him that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him in his coming. What is my heart in bringing this message? Every single person I'm looking at here, I want you to be confident when the Lord returns. There are those who have served even as pastors, as I mentioned, as, as deacons and deaconesses. And they can't be confident in the return of the Lord. Something's not right. My concern is that you are confident as you await the return of the Lord. That you're serving His body. We don't ever retire from that. We don't ever resign from that. Our roles will change. Our positions will change. Our memories may change. Our, our physical abilities to serve and do and go, and those may change. We, may, we become more dependent on others to see and to hear and all of those things. But our dependency is on Christ and our heart's desire is always aligned. How can I be used to serve? You know, Rusty and Mary celebrated 50 years yesterday. Wow, praise God for that. Amen. Yesterday, right? Same, you guys share the same anniversary, Dave and Jan? Yeah? No. Friday, Saturday, 45 years married, right? Ladies have served as deaconesses in the body. Praise God for faithful ministry to the Lord. Faithfulness, God's faithfulness in marriage. As we all know, on left on our own, we make a hash of it. We just mess it up. The only thing good is Christ in us. So what happened in Acts 6? When the church appointed the leaders and they led in the right way, then the word of God spread. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in, in, in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. The people that you thought, that person would never come to faith in Christ. Do you know how committed they are to that church down the road over here? They're this and they're that, and they've been in that church forever, and their granddaddy was in that church, and the other granddaddy, I mean, they've been always in that church. And the gospel shines forth, and suddenly people go from being damned in religion to redeemed in Christ. How does that happen? through love displayed in the body and our words and our actions, the gospel lived out and proclaimed. So where are you today? Will you join me in saying, God, I'm willing to serve you. Here I am. And will you also join in saying, God, raise up those who will serve you willingly. We need men to serve. We need men who are these kind of men. 
will say, I'm not going to do it by compulsion. No, no arm twisting. But I get it. That verse 13, I want that. So God, if you would be willing and gracious, put the jersey on me and I will wear it in grace. Let's stand together. Lord, we gather in your name once again today. We are desperately in need of your grace and mercy, not just for our salvation, but to sustain us throughout all of life. I thank you for those who in years gone by have served you faithfully, Lord. And I pray that you will raise up more laborers in your vineyard. God, I pray that our men who serve in this body as deacons, that they will be reverent, that they will not be double-tongued, that they will be men of integrity, that we will not have any men who serve who have a love of alcohol, that they will not be greedy for money, Lord, but that they will hold the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. I pray that as men are tested, that they will trust in you and draw close to you and go through the testing so that they might serve you as deacons being found blameless. I pray for the wives of our deacons. I pray for the deaconesses as they are called, to Lord, to be reverent, that they are to mind their tongues and not use their tongues that you have given to them to slander people, but to encourage, to speak the truth in love. May they be temperate. May they be faithful in all things. And Father, the weighty task that rests upon those who are husbands and fathers, may they be fully devoted to their one wife. May they love their wives the way Christ, you love the church. May they lead and rule in their households, their children, so that they rule their own house as well. And we thank you for the promise, your reward for those who have served well, that they will obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is all, it all comes back to where it all begins. It's with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.